Um, we're kicking it off with a keynote by Yehuda Lindel, engineering fellow at Coinbase. Yehuda started his research back in 1998, and he thought he was late to the game then. He worked overtime to close the gaps, and in 2015, he co-founded Unbound Security, where he served as CEO. Yoda's hard work paid off. Unbound became the golden standard for crypto security until it was acquired by Coinbase in 2021. Yoda now serves as a head of cryptography at the world's largest crypto exchange. I hope you're as excited to hear from him as we are to have him here today. Please give him a warm well a warm round of applause and welcome Yoda. Thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, good morning, everyone. I know that it's uh, very early, and I'm suspect of people of, in the computing industry who get up so early, so uh, I will see how it goes. But I also got up early. So what I want to talk about is uh, simultaneously improving usability and security. And uh, not so much as a catchphrase, but really because I believe that if we want to enable mass, mass adoption, and we have to change fundamentally the way that we're building things like uh, uh, crypto wallets. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, this is joint work with uh, the cryptography team at, uh, at Coinbase and some others as well. So I want to start with what I call the self-custody dilemma. So self-custody, which is probably what most people in this room uh, prescribe to, uh, works by the user holding their own key on their mobile device or their laptop, or maybe they have a, a dedicated hardware device. And the advantages are immediately clear. Uh, most importantly, your keys, your coins, uh, but not just, not just because that's a popular statement, but because it really means you have full control over your assets. And it's really the whole reason that we're moving to decentralization. So no one can prevent you from using your keys or spending your assets. You're not reliant on any, uh, anyone apart from yourself. Uh, it's also worth noting that other assets like NFTs and in general Web3 type applications don't really align themselves well with a central, with, uh, sorry, yeah, don't, don't, do not uh, align themselves with a centralized uh, type of exchange. They could, you could um, have such a, a custodian hold separate keys for each user, but usually they hold uh, a pool of assets, so it doesn't really work for those sorts of applications either, and it really misses the point in any case. So what are the disadvantages? The disadvantages are actually the same as the advantages. Uh, you, you, you are fully responsible. Uh, because you hold your keys, you're responsible for uh, making sure they don't get lost or getting stolen. Uh, and actually, that's a huge challenge. And it's also worth noting that the problems or, or the risk of it, uh, something getting lost and stolen are actually at odds with each other. In order to prevent it being lost, you want to add redundancy. You want to have many copies of the key in many different places. That makes it easy to steal. Uh, if you want to make it hard to steal, you want to have a few copies in very hard to get out places. That adds uh, uh, the risk that it gets lost. Uh, there are also many stories of users asking um, for something like a password reset on their wallet but it makes no sense and they get told, uh, we can't do that. Your password is used to encrypt your key. You've lost it and they're very confused because this isn't the experience that they're expecting. It might seem funny to those of us in the room who understand the technology, uh, but it's not for the average user. From a security perspective, it's also problematic. User devices are not very good from a security perspective. Uh, they're much more at risk than servers in a, uh, 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 an enterprise that has a very strong security team. Users are also vulnerable to social engineering. And when you have a mnemonic, which is the typical way that you back up a key, as soon as you have that mnemonic, uh, you can be tricked into giving it up. And uh, backup is, is a massive pain. How, how, how and, and to back up securely is even harder and something that users uh, just have a hard time doing. So here are a couple of examples. I want you to think about a regular non-expert user with their first experience in, the, in, in this world with, a, with some digital asset. They're, to, they're asked to download a wallet so they can participate in some Web3 experience or something else. And they get these warnings. Never disclose your backup phrase. Anyone with this phrase can take your ether forever. 
this is not a good way to start an user experience. It's like signing up for your bank and getting a message, well, if somebody somehow guesses your password, we took no responsibility and you've lost all of your money. Uh, that is not a very encouraging way to start. Or I understand that if I lose my recovery phrase, I'll lose all of the crypto in my wallet. Wow. Okay, this is intimidating, scary, and will typically uh, make a lot of users just opt out of uh, uh, the entire um, experience. In terms of social engineering, uh, these, these are real examples against Ledger wallets. Uh, users get sent messages that your wallet needs to be updated. There's a firmware error, and if you don't update, you could lose all of your funds. That's very scary. In order to update, go to this website and type in your mnemonic in order to update your wallet. Again, these are silly to people who understand, and it's obvious that it's a scam, but to most of the world, it's not. And that's what we have to think about. We have to think about the average user, and we have to realize that many, many users will fall to these type of scams. And in contrast to uh, what we're used to in you know, the banking world or, or financial industry or just general Web2 uh, uh, sort of scenario, we have no mitigation about what happens if someone actually falls for this scam. So if somebody fishes my um, banking password, there is a limit to how much they can steal. They can't steal all of my money because there are other controls there in place. And, uh, you know, there might be a limit to how much you can transfer every day. There might be additional step-up authentication if I'm doing something uh, extraordinary. But once someone steals my digital asset key, they've got everything. And because it's blockchain, it's irreversible. So this is devastating and something that we just, we have to find out ways of avoiding this at all costs. So the other possibility is to go for an exchange, central exchange or custodian, and they hold your funds for you. The advantages are also clear. The burden of management and security is on them, and they are far better at security and backup than regular users. In fact, they're probably far better than even advanced users because uh, they have an entire security team working on it. And this is not working now. There we go. And uh, they can also... Um, enforce or, or use additional anti-fraud and other mechanisms like the credit card companies. So if they see a transaction that's unusual, they can uh, contact you or have step-up authentication. There can be policies on how much you can transfer uh, without requiring <clears throat> something additional, manual, that they can really verify. And all of those things will protect users against losing all of their money. And again, if users lose their money, then this... Uh, uh, Beyond is, of course, a massive barrier to adoption. So, uh, but the disadvantages are also clear. Not all exchanges are equal, and we've seen it recently. What happens if the exchange uh, is fraudulent or goes bankrupt? And it's also not decentralized. To some extent, it's sort of like, why bother building a whole decentralized system to put everything in a centralized organization? Although personally, and this is just a parenthetic comment, I actually believe that a combination of both makes sense. Like, yes, I do want to have money in my wallet where I'm in control, but I also want to have some money in a bank. Uh, but that's a personal, you know, I guess it depends on the application and, and the situation. But in general, if we're putting everything into an exchange, then we've sort of like defeated the point as well. And I don't need to spend time on this slide. We all are very, very familiar and aware of the dangers of some centralized organizations, especially ones that are not transparent and are not publicly audited and so on and so forth. So the self-custody dilemma, as I stated, is that uh, on the one hand, users need and want to have the experience, both from a usability and security perspective, of a centralized exchange, but we need to be able to somehow do that in a way that is self-custodial. And that's the dilemma that we have, and I argue that we absolutely have to solve that if we want to enable mass adoption. If we don't solve this problem, then the masses are not going to be able to use this technology. So again, just to say it again, because I think it's a really important way of stating it, uh, we want a self-custodial solution with a user experience and security of an exchange, or maybe stated differently, we want Web3 infrastructure with the feel of Web2. 
So I argue that uh, MPC enables you to achieve uh, this type of, uh, of, of uh, uh, user experience and, and uh, uh, both security-wise and usability-wise while still being self-custodial. I don't know of any other technology that enables that. So what is MPC, very, very briefly? A technology going back to the mid to late 80s, uh, thousands of research papers. We have a very deep understanding of the science and technology. This is not something uh, new and unstudied. Um, but now, very applied uh, area of research and uh, being integrated in many places in industry and enables users to compute on data without revealing anything. But the, really the way to think about if you're not a cryptographer is very simple. Think about uh, a trusted black box, trusted hardware, where the users can communicate uh, securely with that hardware, send their inputs and get back output. Uh, but actually there is no trusted hardware and this is run by a protocol um, being just messages being sent between the parties. And depending on the model, but for the one I want to talk about now, as long as one of the participating parties is honest, then this protocol indeed behaves like this uh, um, uh, trusted hardware. And I guess that's one of the why MPC is attractive in this field because it really talks about replacing some trusted entity with uh, distributed security, with um, a, set of, a, a, ser a set of participants who, as long as at least one of them is honest, everything is fine. Uh, in the context of threshold signing, what do we have? So we have, um, uh, we generate a key. Also, we generate a key in MPC, so it's never in any single place. And we share it amongst the entities. I'm going to just, just talk about two uh, parties here, although it can, of course, be more. So think about the private key K being shared additively, so two devices or two entities hold uh, shares, a K1 and a K2, that sum to the actual key. Each piece, K1 and K2, reveals no information whatsoever about the key. It's like a one-time pad encryption, but essentially you know nothing with only one piece. And, uh, but you're able to sign by running an MPC protocol between these two devices without revealing the shares to each other. And the security guarantees that you have is that even if one of the parties is fully malicious, and by that I mean they can run arbitrary attack code, they know exactly what the protocols are, they completely own one of the machines, then uh, firstly privacy means that the attacker can't learn anything beyond the result of the computation, which is the signature, and that's what you want to learn. So, of course, that's fine. You're allowed to learn that. Uh, but in particular, nothing is learned about the key. And importantly, correctness guarantees that the only values or transactions that can be signed upon are those that both parties agree to. So you can't have a situation where I want to transfer $10,000 to someone and suddenly a million dollars is being transferred to somebody else because the other party is cheating. And that means that you need both parties to approve a transaction and to actively participate in it in order to be able to do anything. And this is, of course, uh, guaranteed cryptographically and mathematically proven secure. Uh, of course, assuming that the proof is correct and assuming that the implementation uh, in the code matches what's in the theoretical paper. Uh, but those uh, are, of course, you know, more about how you deploy MPC and how to do that correctly, which isn't the focus of what I'm going to talk about today. So, uh, and in general, in order to break this model, the attacker would have to break into both devices, and if one is a server and one is an end-user device, then these are very, very separated environments and something which is hard to do. Now, when I talk about corruptions, what exactly do I mean? As a user, if I am, have a mobile and I have a key share on my mobile, I'm not trying to steal from myself. I would also argue that in the vast majority of cases, the service provider is not trying to steal from the users because that's the best way of going bankrupt. But we are concerned with what happens when a user's device go is under attack and is infected by malware. Or what happens if there is an insider at the service provider. Or even just they're subpoenaed. Uh, what happens in those scenarios? So we want to ensure security not because we think that one of the participants is actually corrupted, uh, but because we're afraid that someone corrupt has infiltrated uh, those devices or those organizations. And that's what MPC can protect us against. 
So what's an MPC-based wallet? We share the key between the user mobile and the browser. And the uh, our important properties we ha have are first and foremost, the service provider cannot transact without the user. So the service provider just doesn't hold the key. They hold a share of the key, but they can't transact without the user, meaning that they can't take your money without your permission, basically. Malware on the user's mobile isn't enough for key theft because, again, on the user's mobile, all you have is a share of the key, which is meaningless within itself. You might think, but one second, I don't need to steal the user's key. I, inf I, I uh, install malware on their, on their uh, uh, device, and then I ask myself to sign on a fraudulent transaction. As since I am now impersonating the user because I have full control over the phone, I'm able to do that and I can just steal all of their money anyway. And you don't have to steal the key in order to steal someone's money. You just need to get a fraudulent signature. And I, as the malware, can uh, you know, uh, authenticate, so to speak, and bypass everything on the mobile. So this can be mitigated in multiple ways. Uh, firstly, on high-end devices, you can use things like encrypting the uh, share on the mobile using uh, uh, the secure enclave, which would require biometric authentication. It's harder to bypass on, on good phones. But something which is more fundamental is that you can enforce policies on both sides. So at the exchange or the service provider and the user, you will say that there maybe is a rate limit or you need additional authentication to do something which is above or if it's, if it's, if it's a suspect type of uh, uh, um, transaction, you can uh, use other fraud mitigation me measures. You can have allow lists and disallow lists and they're enforced on both sides and therefore cannot be bypassed just while on the phone. This is exactly the Web2 or uh, um, the centralized uh, custodian type of protections and advantages we get, but without being in the custodial scenario. Backup of the user share, which is a massive problem today. This whole mnemonic thing is an absolute nightmare. The backup is easy because it's only one share. And if it's only one share, then you can put it in your iCloud and uh, it's not nearly as much of a threat as putting the entire mnemonic because if you get that share, again, there are other protections and it doesn't give you enough information to do anything. But it's important to understand that a naive implementation of this is still not going to be self-custody. It might be what some people call non-custodial, which is a concept which doesn't really exist. Uh, um, at least from a regulatory perspective, there's custodial and there's self-custodial, and uh, um, the, in, in particular, in this model, if the service provider wants to censor you and pre prevent you from carrying, on, carrying out a transaction, all they need to do is stop playing with you. So they can't carry out any transactions by themselves, but they can prevent you from transacting. So how do you prevent that? We actually have two backups. One is we call a service provider-aided backup, and here the user holds their share of their key in their iCloud, for example, and the service provider holds their share. And if you lose your phone, it falls in the toilet, uh, something bad happened, uh, you can very easily um, uh, restore and get back to your original state in a very automatic web to type experience of authenticating to your uh, a service provider, and it looks like a password reset in the background, transparently you're going to retrieve the share from the iCloud, but the user doesn't even know about that. So this is the user experience that we want, but we can also add a self-custody backup where both the service provider and the user encrypt their shares under a public key belonging to the user, and that, those two encrypted shares are stored somewhere by the user. And if you want this, then of course you need to strongly protect the key that the public key that belongs to the user. It can be, again, a secure enclave on a, uh, uh, on, on a high-end phone. It could be a UB key or it could be something else. But the full key is never revealed at any time. There's still no mnemonic, but now it's full self-custody because the user can reconstruct by accessing those two ciphertexts uh, accessing the, uh, um, their private key and decrypting. And this is a way that you can get full self-custody without compromising on everything else. So, in short, 
This type of uh, architecture gives you the user experience and security of an exchange because everything happens at the exchange in terms of the controls. Uh, reset or restore is like password reset in a general, it feels like password reset to a user even though it's absolutely not, and, but it's still completely self-custodial. So just to run through it again, security, the user only holds one share on the mobile device and backup, so it's far less risky. The user has no mnemonic, so isn't vulnerable to social engineering or far less vulnerable. The service provider can run fraud and risk analysis, and both parties can enforce policies. So this is everything that we wanted from a security perspective. From a usability perspective, uh, the, uh, share, the user's share isn't sensitive within itself, it's not I wouldn't make it public, but it's not as sensitive, so you can allow automatic and transparent backup. Uh, you don't have a mnemonic, which is a pain, and everything that we've talked about. In order to do this, there are a number of technical problems that have to be solved, which I won't talk about at all today, but you need to have secure MPC protocols for all of these uh, steps, like key generation, signing, something called refresh, which I, which I didn't discuss, but ensures that uh, um, the sharing itself changes uh, over time. Uh, you need to have HD wallet support so that you back up your, uh, you only have to do backup once and can derive many keys, but you need to do that now in MPC. You need to make sure that when you are deriving, you, can't, you, uh, you force uh, that the inputs are used correctly on both sides. You don't want a situation where one of the sides is corrupted and, and you end up deriving a key which later you cannot trace back to your original backup. This is something that MPC in general doesn't, uh, like basic MPC doesn't provide, so you have to add that in. And you also need publicly verifiable backup, which is a backup, an encrypted backup that you can verify is correct without decrypting. Uh, we want to make sure, again, if you, that the backup is absolutely valid and you might have a lot of money there and not, and not we can't rely on both of the parties being honest because our entire model is that even if one is corrupted, everything needs to be fine. So in summary, uh, I argue that MPC wallets can solve some of the major problems that we have in usability and security. And, uh, but one word of warning is that MPC is, uh, although uh, technology that's been around for a long time, or science has been around for a long time, it still requires expert expertise to, to deploy. A lot of the open source code out there is vulnerable, especially in academic, um, academic uh, uh, libraries. These are not meant to be production libraries, and so uh, one should, needs to take care when uh, implementing such a solution. Thank you very much.